So when you're talking about how do you begin, where's the beginning of Jewish thought? Where do you start? So Rambam says, the foundation of all foundations and the pillar of wisdom is knowing that nothing causes itself. So to understand this, Avraham, the Midrash tells us Avraham had a medallion that he wore around his neck. And he ha it had a picture of the sun. And people would gaze at it for healing. And the people would say, who made this medallion? And he said, I did. But who made what's on the medallion? Who made the sun itself? So the answer to the question, where did everything come from? Why isn't that a question? Why do you think this isn't a question that many people ask today? So I want to talk to you about the reason for this. So um, think about the pen you're holding. Some of you are holding a pen. OK, what's the pen made out of? Plastic. plastic. Where does plastic come from? Petroleum. Petroleum. Petroleum is in the earth, right? But nobody associates a pen with petroleum. So the reason is human wisdom developed technologies that could take something that's in the earth, the raw material of petroleum, and turn it into a pen that writes, which is a huge achievement. So because there are so many steps, hundreds of steps, between petroleum and this, we, ha we end up stopping before we take anything to its original cause. So if you were to say, where's the pen from? You would say, the store. I mean, and if you would start giving somebody a whole spiel about petroleum, like, they'd look at you like you were crazy. Okay, in earlier times, when the world was less technologically developed, so if you pull food off a tree, there aren't so many stops along the way. If you kill an animal and you eat its flesh, you have life force that comes from somewhere. There's not so many steps along the way. So in earlier times, people had much, a much stronger sense of sourcehood. And today, we've lost it. So a question you could ask is, who cares where everything came from? Why is it relevant to anything? So the pen came from petroleum. Petroleum is in the earth. So OK, so I want, I want to give you um, a concrete picture of where this is going. In the 80s, large numbers of immigrants from Ethiopia came to Israel. They were living in a society that was very, very undeveloped technologically. It, of course, it depended on where they came from. People from Addis knew about technology. People from the villages really did not. I want to give you a picture of how undeveloped they were. There was um, a kid who came. And they put him in a boys' school called Boys Town, G a genius of a kid. He ended up. Um, winning some kind of international computer award. So he was on the media, and they said, I bet in Ethiopia you never saw a computer. He said, a computer, until I got on the plane, I never saw stairs. Got this? So when they came, they took them to um, what they call Ma'on Olim, which are immigrant quarters. So it's simple housing, where you have, like each family was given a little apartment, you come in, there's like a bedroom, a little kitchenette, and another small room. Okay? Is this bigger or smaller than their homes in Ethiopia? Much bigger. Okay, so they're exploring this. Now, they never saw flat floors. They were used to mud, packed mud. So they start looking, there's things that like seem protrusions that come out of the walls. What are some protrusions that would come out of the walls in a normal apartment? Lights. Tell me more. Pipes. What? Pipes. No, pipes are in the wall. Or like, I don't know, like H bag pipes, you know? Nah, not in the moment. Not in. A sink, a toilet. Oh. Okay, so they had no idea of what to do with this stuff. So you figure out the lights as soon as you play with them, right? You know, look at that. It has instant fire. You know, like that they could do. But if you were them, and I'm not saying this patronizing, because I think this was reasonable thinking, what would you think a toilet is? But you see the sink as well. And the sink is higher, so it's easier to wash things in the sink, which, of course, they would use both for laundry and dishes. What would you think a toilet is? Kneel down in front of it, wash your face. Okay. 
put your feet in to wash your feet. Okay, does that make sense? Of course it makes sense. Okay, so that was their beginning point. So at some point, the social workers felt a need to explain to them, you know, this is, this is, this is what we do with the sink, this is what we do with the toilet. Okay. So the question they were asking, when they got to other things, was where are these rules from? So one of the things that happened there was they would eat in a central dining room and there were people who served. In Ethiopian culture, the father serves the family. It's his way of showing that he's the one who sustains the family. It was very insulting to have a stranger serve the family. There were suicides. Okay. So why am I telling you this? What does this have to do with anything about asking about where things come from? Why am I talking about this? The more you look at anything, the more you could see that there's always reason for order. If there's order, then there's reason, then there's plan. Is the world a place of order or is the world a place of chaos? Okay, so the true answer is both. Okay, which is natural and which is human imposed? And chaos, we're good at that, okay. Okay, so you look at a, wor a world with extreme order, so that usually takes people who are willing to look to the realization that there's a plan and that we're part of the plan. So I wanna throw an idea at you. In nature, everything does do what it can do. So all plants um, that can photosynthesize, photosynthesize. There's no such thing as a plant that'll say, Photosynthesis is just like not my thing. I don't like chlorophyll. It's just not me, okay? Everything does do what it can do. There are no birds that can fly that don't fly. Could you see where this is set? So everything is wired to do what it could do. And this is true on a microbiotic level. This is true on every possible level. There are no cells that say, I don't want to divide. I like wholeness. Okay, I want independent, no, okay. So humans are part of this plan. What are some powers that humans have that, other, that nothing else has? I would want to maintain that a human should do what a human should do if a human is part of nature. So what are some powers we have? If I came today to school with my friend Gloria the ape. Here's Gloria, you all see her? Okay. So what are some things I could do that Gloria can't do? Question. Think. I could question. Think. I could think far more analytically. Imagine. Imagine. Okay. Use free will. Use free will. Go, uh, uh, go against your, yourself, your nature. Uh, go against self-interest. That's huge. Okay. Tell me more. Create new things. Make new things. Be aesthetic, right? Okay, so the premise now is that a good person is a person who somehow finds their place in the pattern of the whole. Does this make sense to you? So now let's go back to why don't people think about this? Everybody wants to be happy, is that true? Yes, people, do you want to be happy or miserable? Everybody will choose happy. I want to suggest to you that when you use everything you are that brings about happiness, and when you repress who you are, it doesn't bring about happiness. Does that make sense? Okay, so now I'm going to go back to what we said at the beginning. Noticing that there's a source for all things means the plan has reason. There's a reason why we're given these abilities. Because chaos doesn't create order. Does that make sense to you, that premise? Chaos doesn't create order? So um, nobody would think that the pen made itself. So we're part of something, there's a planner. Now notice the word I'm avoiding. The word I'm avoiding is God. So why don't people uh, say, I don't believe in order, I don't believe in meaning, but they do say, I don't believe in God. People will usually, if you push people, will say, do you think that the world has meaning? People will say yes. Mm -hmm. That means that there's plan, yes. Do you believe in God? No. 
So what's the difference between using the G word and saying intelligence that brought everything about, which people really do believe in? It makes people makes, makes uncomfortable. It scares them out of their skin. And makes them think that there's someone in charge of them, even though they don't want there to be. But people think it's superstitious yeah. nonsense. And they think it's someone and not. Oh, that's the problem. Yeah. The problem is that when people hear the word God, they think that God is what they were taught the word means. So they don't even know the Judaic definition of God. But the God that they don't believe in, we don't believe in either. Does that make sense to you? So I remember when I was sec in second grade, it was in the public school, our teacher, Mrs. Neary, had the girls draw a picture of God. What do you think second graders drew? Do you remember being in second grade? Do you remember how young that is? That would be seven-year-olds. You remember being seven? So seven-year-olds are very imaginative. This is the year of, of cartoons. And, you know, how do you think most of the people drew gods? Stick figures. Okay, some, some, okay, so some drew stick figures. The Christian kids consistently drew, cross, or drew crosses. Okay, and I still remember what I drew. I drew clouds, and I made one of them with a face. Okay, so to me, it was clear. Two things seemed very clear at that point. One is that God is a myth. We already knew what myths are. And that a myth means that you think a person somehow made everything. If you think God is a person, of course you can't believe in God. How could you believe a person brought everything about? Okay, um, try to remember, I don't even remember the name of this movie. I was on the, on the plane and they had a movie about Moses and the Ten Commandments. Did any of you see uh, this? The new one? It was a new one. It was a, I mean, yeah. no, it was two, three years old. I didn't, you know. It was the worst, I mean, it was a terrible movie. But in this movie, the God character was a child. Yes. You saw it? Such an awful movie. I mean, just, so how could anybody who takes that kind of thinking seriously believe in God? Okay, you understand this? So the God of the West is the Christological God whose presence is based on previously existent myths. Okay, so that's not a God we could believe in. Okay, so the question is, who's God? So Avram asked this question, who made everything? Where did it all come from? So by the time he was 45, he had a religious system, but there were steps along the way. The first thing was discovering what isn't true. So there's a basic premise that in order to know what's true, you have to be able to pinpoint not this. This is true in science also. Experimentation is based on saying not this, not this, not this, before you'll say that. So in his day, what did people think God was? This was way before Christianity. So they didn't think person. What did they think God was in his day? Uh, na natural forces. So I'll just give you two examples of what this would play out as. There were people who worshipped the dust of their feet. Now you could think that's stupid, like the dust of your feet, like what you see at the bottom of your shower, like no. But they saw the earth itself as being that which brings forth everything. Is that true? The earth has nothing of its own, but it brings forth everything. And everything returns to the earth. So they would worship the earth as being the source of all things. What question weren't they asking? Where does the earth come from? Where does the earth draw its vitality from? Where does it come from? Okay, so this form of earth worship still existed in Europe until the medieval era. Did you do you know this? Paganism? Many Halloween, many of the um, the non-Jewish holidays still have a, a bit of Mother Earth worship attached to it. Okay, other people worship the sun. Why would they worship the sun? Energy and what else? Light. Light. And heat. right. So it's the energy is what creates everything. But the question they're asking that they weren't asking was still the same question, which is what? How did, how did it come? Where did the energy come from? If you were to ask a scientist today, where did everything come from? What would he say? So let's talk about the Big Bang. 
Okay, so do you understand how the Big Bang works? Yes, no? So let's look at it from the, um, from a, from the perspective of astronomy, because that's the easiest way to talk about it. Here are two stars. They're this far apart. But this actually would be many thousands of miles, right? You're looking at them in the Hubble telescope. They're like this today. Tomorrow they're like this. That means they're even further apart. The next day they're like that. Okay, so that's telling you that the universe is expanding. So that means that yesterday it was like this, and the day before it was like this. The day before it was like, at some point, it must have all of these, the forces, the magnetic forces that are drawing the stars apart must have all been in one place and at one time, and then somehow <coughs> it imploded, and that was the Big Bang. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. What question aren't they asking? Where did that? Where's that? Where did all that electromagnetic stuff come from? Okay, clear? So the, que like the avoided question is the same avoided question that Avram contended with 4,000 years ago. Okay, so, um, and in fact in physics, oftentimes they'll just take it back further until you get it to, um, do, do you like science? If you don't like science, I don't know. Yeah? You have like subatomic particles that have force that don't have order, which is very interesting. And they'll, they'll attribute things to that, but the question doesn't change at all. They call it the God particle. Yeah. They don't call it God, it's God particle. Right, that's what they call it. They don't believe in God, but, okay, but they believe in, but the basic question is still unanswered. Okay, so when Avram was 15, he knew what wasn't true. He said, whatever you're attributing it to, if it's physical, that's not the answer. So his parents were sun worshippers. His father had an idol store. So one fine day he broke all of the idols except the largest one. He put all of the shards in the arms of the largest idol. His father, I have to say, became much more sympathetic to over the years. Comes in and says, what happened? I can't leave you in the store for 15 lousy minutes, or whatever he said in those <laughs> days. And he said, he broke all the other ones. What would happen next? Slap, slap, what are you crazy? What do you think it is? Do you think it doesn't cost money? Where do you, you know, like, okay, right? So he said, you don't really believe this either. So I want to tell you something. By and large, people who worship idols don't really believe in it completely. Could you see where this is so? They believe in the underlying values that they create around the idols, but that the idols themselves have power. Everyone knows if I made it, it didn't make me. Okay, clear? So what are the underlying values? When people talk about Mother Earth, or the Great Sun, or, wow, the God particles, what are they looking at? So when you look, does this interest you still? I still have you. When you look at the history of religions, what you'll see is that people take the attributes that they most admire in themselves, which they can identify as spiritual because they're not physical, and they apply it to whatever object they're worshiping. Like the Egyptians, okay? Like the earth worshippers who were even in Europe. So it can be from nurturing to providing. Yes. It could be Mother Earth is, an, is the nurturer, the sun is the source of enlightenment, okay? And the Greeks, like, got this down to, they had all of their mythic gods were like all of the different traits that are there in the human psyche. So, um, so by the time Avram was 15, he knew this wasn't true but he didn't know what was. Okay, when, but when people know that the religions they believe in aren't true except for the underlying values, but the actual idols are not true, what do they do? Think today's world. Do any of you know devout Christians? I have a friend who's a nun. We disagree on many <laughs> issues. <laughs> okay. Although she doesn't really believe, like she has a million icons, but she doesn't really believe that the icons themselves have force. She believes in compassion and love, which is what she thinks, um, what's his name again, epitomizes. So why does she have icons? What's she thinking? She's Greek Orthodox. She has a million icons. It's like so. What is she thinking? Why does she still have icons? Maybe just as a reminder. Okay. Partially as a reminder, and there's, part, there's something else there. 
case, uh, making a symbol, this is what it is, makes you feel like you got it. You know the aha complex in psychology? You know what that is? They, uh, so here's what it is. You know they have this toy that pe people give babies at around one and a half. It's a hollow square with shapes cut out. And there are blocks that fit in the shapes. And the baby initially starts like trying to ram any block in any shape. But eventually they figure out, usually first by accident, square hole, square shape, round hole, round shape, right? They get it. So the first time they get it on purpose, like as I said, usually the first time is accidental. So you know, they put the round, they, then they say, that's called the aha response. It's like, ah. okay, yeah? The aha response, I got it, I understand it, and that feels very empowering and very delightful. So what holds people to the icons is a false symbol of control. I got it. It's all about compassion, just like he had, just like that. Just, you understand this? It embodies it, makes it tangible. It's very delightful. It's terrible because it keeps you away from truth. OK, clear? So here's what Avram figured out by the time he was 45. He figured out that the idols are only distractions, dangerous distractions. They empower human beings who are corrupt. They're terrible. But what's the source of all things? It has to be something non-physical. Because if it's physical, you still have the same old question. So it has to be something non-physical. What does the word physical mean? Something tangible. Tangible. It exists in time and space. It's something that isn't time. Time really relates to space. And it isn't space. It doesn't occupy space. Okay, so it's not physical, so that means also you can't talk about there being more than one because numbers have to do with tangibility. You can't have two infinities. Where does one end? Where does the other one begin? So you know whatever the force is, intangible, one, unknowable. Why unknowable? Not just unknown, but unknowable. Ah, because human knowledge is based on observation, and observation has, takes us all the way back to what? Physicality. Physicality, tangibility. We know this force is, can't be fully grasped by us. Is one, okay, is the source of all things, brought together everything with extreme order, and realize he knew far less about how orderly the world is than we do. So to Avram, an orderly world meant like, wow, look at the food chain. He didn't know about microbes. He didn't know about the ecology. We know far, far more about how orderly the world is than he did. But he got it anyway. He figured it out. He said, therefore, I'm part of it. I have to figure out my role. So the reason why it's worth knowing that there's a spiritual source for all things, the word spiritual just meaning non-physical, is that you're part of the ecology. You have to figure out what you should do with your creativity, with your intellect, with your moral choice capacity. So Avram concluded that humans have a certain aspect of spirituality in themselves. So for our purpose, let's call it a soul. The soul isn't the body. This is why you would still be you. You would never become me, no matter what happens to your body. Do you know who Dr. DeBakey was? Have you heard this name? He was the founder of brain surgery. He also later became a major heart surgeon. Okay, so this takes us back. He died back in the 80s, I'm not sure. Okay, so he began his medical career as an atheist because in those days, people believed, and I'm using the word believed rather than know on purpose, that you can't be a scientist and be religious. That religion and science, whatever. This is the era of the Clarence Darrow and the scope trials, you know. So he was an atheist, and he became a, a believer. He became a, a Christian. Okay, he was born to a Christian family, but he became a devout Christian. Why? It was, his brain, it was his brain surgeries that do it. So did any of you actually see a brain or a picture of a brain? What does it look like? Do you remember? You know what elbow macaroni looks like? So it looks like gray elbow macaroni, all sort of jammed together to form two shapes that fit in one to the other. But its texture is like gray jello. Okay, 
So he would do surgeries, and the brain is like enormously complex. So you know the brain surgery jokes like, oops, there goes the piano lessons, you know, whatever. He said, the brain might contain consciousness, but the brain isn't consciousness. The brain is physical. Love, hate, jealousy, that may be contained within the memory or the pathways of the brain, but the brain doesn't generate it, and it's far beyond what the brain is. So he began to believe in the soul, and from there to believe in God. Okay, does that make sense to you? So, yeah? So the body, even the brain, isn't the soul. In psychology, they think the personality is a collection of responses to memories. You're familiar with this? So I want to show you why that's not the soul. All of the things that happen subsequently are added upon a primal sense of self. So this is before you went to school and had an education. It's before you were influenced very heavily by the media. It's before that awful boyfriend when you were 15. So it's before what they call the event horizon. So there's a certain sense of self that's there. So that's your soul. So when you're talking about your soul, Avram said humans have a soul, and the soul is enormously variegated. Personality is vast. But the soul is an aspect that's spiritual. It's not physical. And therefore, he decided on his own, which is a huge intellectual accomplishment, that the soul is similar to the force that brought everything about, the spiritual force, and that the function of the soul is to expand and to be more godlike. Does that make sense to you? So this is why when Avram began his career, so to speak, it was with a commitment to be a giver. He saw all of these human capacities, creativity, imagination, moral choosing, aesthetic consciousness, if they're used by the soul, then it's about giving. Does that make sense to you? So basically, the body wants always to take. Have a break, have, have lunch, have a relationship. That's not really a relationship. Okay, take, and the soul wants to give. So Avram made his message to give people awareness of how human they become through giving. Okay, so I want you to realize how important this message is historically. Think about Yerushalayim. Not only Orthodox Jews live in Yerushalayim. Who else lives here? What other people live here? Christians. Christians. Who else? Arabs. Arabs. Okay. Tourists. Okay. <laughs> They're their own race. Okay. If you were to survey every single Arab in Yerushalayim and all of the suburbs, you know, Abu Disk, um, Jabal Mukhabar, every single one of them, and say, did the fact that there was a man called Avraham who brought the idea of knowledge of there being a God who created everything and that he could be reached. Does that have anything to do with your life? If they're honest, what would they say? Yes. Absolutely. If you were to take this to the Christians and the Jews, certainly. This is where a feeling of accountability comes from. This is where basic morality comes from. We're here for a purpose. We have to live up to this. If we don't, we're somehow moral failures. That makes sense to you? Okay, so uh, moving on with Avraham's life, I'm going to take you to the end of his life and work backwards. The end of his life, his wife Sarah had died earlier. Okay, Sarah had brought a co-wife into the marriage called Hagar because she had no children and she, she saw how this was a heartbreaker to Avraham, so she suggested a surrogate wife. Okay, it didn't work out. The surrogate wife destroyed the relationship. She left, okay, she was sent out more correctly, and she changed in the course of time. She changed her name from Hagar to Keturah. Avraham remarried her after Hagar's death. Okay, I have you? Okay, he had children with her. It says he sent them, he gave them gifts and sent them away. Where did he send them? So it says in the text, he sent them to the <coughs> east. So when you go to the east, and the journey that they went was from Arabia all the way to the far east. Any basic belief in there being accountability, one God, 
imitative of God. It came through the descendants of Keturah and Avraham. So I'm not saying that this is cause and effect. I'm just saying it's an interesting thing. That, um, that in the Hindu caste system, which, it's, which isn't actually religious, the caste system is sociological more than religious, the highest level is what? Brahmins. What name does that bring you back? Abraham. OK, clear? It's an interesting thing. So one person's reality could change the whole world by changing consciousness.